So just a general overview of how you think we should be thinking about security, uh, any thoughts on it in general? One of the problems there is a lot of the, the textbooks are out of date because the um, technology moves really quickly and uh, you really need to keep buying books every year basically to keep up with the um, My theory is that, that uh, the people who actually know security are practitioners and they're in the industry making money. A lot of money in many cases. And Probably more money than they make books and courses or writing textbooks. Um, and we, I'm thinking it may take a little while before those people decide to sit down and write a textbook. I think I can do this without the microphone. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, I'm going to throw something out here that most people probably haven't considered. I spent seven years uh, lecturing to first year undergraduates all the way through to master's students. And if you're looking at the undergraduate courses, even in a four year program, most students and a lot of the courses that I've looked at are not ready to present um, defensive programming other than at its very simplest um, fundamentals until the, the late third year or possibly the fourth year. So that leaves one year to try and teach the next generation of programmers and software engineers how to do security properly, how to design security in, how to get it right from the start. And that's not a lot of time. Um, I don't know about people here, but um, I learned about security over a period of three or four years. And you know, to, to address this at an undergraduate level is incredibly difficult. You just don't have time. You can plant the seed. Um, the problem is that, unfortunately, a lot of these mines aren't um, sufficiently fertile to grow that seed. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can't quite be on that. Um, I think it's, I think it's a, a very important, uh, and I agree, it is important that we start to uh, approach this from the point of view of um, let's get people thinking about this earlier. Um, but I think it, it's going to be incredibly difficult to do anything more than get that introduction in. And security scares a lot of people. It's hard enough to keep um, the right minds in that that field. Um, it, it, it's not an easy problem to solve. But I think universities are a good place to start. If you accept, you're not going to get very far. Um, if more of the security tools were open, would be able to use them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, that, that was one of my other questions. Like, how come, given that um, bug checking type of tools have you know developed so much in recent years, how come hardly anyone uses them in practice? Is it a right issue? People who are teaching don't know about these tools because they don't spend any time keeping themselves up to date.
Oh, look, so one point, Bill came from QUT. I've been in security now for 38 years, so uh, the important thing about it is interesting. Look, I'm also, I've been at my time, I'm a board member of the Colloquium for Information System Security Education in the United States. Some years ago, about 15 years ago or more, the United States government recognised that there was a massive education problem that's been talked to in relationship to what they now call information assurance, education and training. Which is a lens training and education in the United States. And that led to the formation of the colloquium, which was to bring together industry, government and academia to try to get this problem underway. It also led to the scholarship for service program where government basically said the other way to get university to teach this stuff is to give them actual positions. So they actually sponsored scholarships specifically to US universities, which run for a four year, four year full sponsorship, full money, and uh, you have to be an approved university organization. In the present moment, we have about 65 universities in the United States who are teaching information assurance um, in the undergraduate and postgraduate uh, programs. We're now moving into what's called two year college programs. So there is a bit of a start in the United States. Not much here in Australia or in just recently in the European community, they're thinking about a similar problem too. How do we address this problem of getting information assurance, education and training down? I think mean, basically, what well, just, just last week, the, the famous statement from a manager in Microsoft, yes, we quote this as well, it was on CNN, it was in Newsweek, quite specifically the problem that occurred in the cryptographic integration into Microsoft Word. You may have seen this in the press. He basically said, look, the guy we got to write that stuff knew nothing about crypto integration or security, and it was an absolute disaster. This is not me saying, this is a Microsoft manager, okay? And it really has been in the last couple of years, we've got a few people educated in information security and assurance that, are, that I'm happy about the way it's been done. Now that's a supplier making an actual statement, okay? And that's what we put. So basically, what can we do? Well, essentially, I think basically it's up to government, first of all, to say we, we acknowledge the problem. Nations are now dependent upon their information infrastructure. We have their information assurance. We will sponsor education and training. Universities won't do it by themselves. There's no money. There's, the cash is not there. So they have to have some way of signing the whole thing up. It also means to have the right teachers in their own teaching. But I'll go back a bit further. Bear in mind, I was solving the wrong problem. Multics, 1967, recognised, for example, that you can't write a secure system. This is computer science and engineering using a bi-state memory. That's impossible. That's, that's computer science, which then, of course, the architecture, which we know, the multiple ring structure, what's called uh, memory typing, code segment based, which we then saw in the Intel 286, chipset, etc., etc. The problem is, the industry totally ignored it. So we're finding a problem today where the underlying hardware architecture, which is still in there, by the way, it's still in there in the Core i7, near there, it's still got all the rings in there, it's still got all the segmentation in there, except the 64 bit mode. The 32 bit mode is still got all that nice architecture, totally turned off by Linux, totally turned off by Solaris, totally turned off by Microsoft Windows. Okay? So we've got a problem. Even if we do produce, the right underlying hardware security infrastructure, does anybody care? Well, the answer practically is no, they don't. Okay? And we're stuck with a, a, a small base of, of, of dual state memory structure. And that's going to be a major problem for us, I think, for the next five or ten years. The question is will the industry bring back what we knew 30, 40 years ago that you have to have a multi state memory, you must have memory typing to get around the problem? Well, maybe the answer is yes. We're starting to see it come back again. GEMSOS has, has been, the GEMSOS kernel has come back again, but it turns on segmentation, it turns on rings in the correct way. It's a fully a one evaluated kernel. So we've got that now. It's starting to rematerialize again. So I'm a little bit hopeful. The question, the question is whether, whether uh, people like Intel will listen to what's near the hardware architecture now, okay? Otherwise, we're stuck with a disaster of Leo with its ridiculous three minus one noises. Um, but we're stuck with this sort of 
mess that we've got ourselves into. So that's the of educational training. I'm not positive in the United States that we do actually have the new US government sponsored program under the Kodaki. And we'll wait and see over the next couple of years where we're under Obama, we start to see that they get some funding. I'm positive it will. We're, we're aiming for a $60 million start fund for this financial budget in the United States to try and get information short education into a four-year uh, program in America. So that could be a good start. So I'm a bit more positive than I was six months ago. Yeah, I would like to add, um, to share like a different perspective to that shared by Garrett uh, about the problem with teaching um, computer security in the academia. Uh, maybe my my perspective uh, may be different. I'm from Argentina, so it may be completely different from the one that you have here. But uh, in Argentina, something like 20 or 30 years ago, the situation was that uh, there's part of the people that was teaching at universities had a main job, a job in the industry. And they teach it one course, a couple of courses at university. And that meant that uh, for the most part, they were able to share the experience that they got from the industry in the academia. I don't know exactly uh, whether uh, the situation changed because of uh, unemployment uh, problems and so on, but the reality right now is like uh, a large amount of the people that is currently teaching at university have that work as their main work. So uh, it's no longer the case that they have uh, experience in the industry that they can share to the academia. For the most part, they are uh, touching the academia and what they share is what they were taught in the academia. So, uh, I, it's my impression that, at least in our educational system, uh, there's a link between the industry and the academia that is broken right now. Uh, and another perspective, I agree with Gary, what he said, that usually in the, in the industry, uh, you get paid much better than in the academia, but I think that there is another problem other than that one. That, uh, <coughs> A large, a large amount of people that actually work in security in the industry, in many cases, they have touched themselves about the stuff that they work on, right? And in order to get a job in the academia, it's usually, uh, the academia looks at all different things, and not really the, uh, the experience that you have in the industry, for example. Uh, as an example that I have, uh, many times I have tried to push people in a university, in a university, a university I work for in Argentina, to get uh, a few guys that work at a security company in Argentina called Core Secure Technologies. Probably many of you know it. They, well, they, they, they are a very successful company. And uh, I tried to get uh, the CTO of that company teach at the university. Now, uh, the, problems, the main problems that we found was that the guy was too young. He had not graduated. Are problems like that. So, uh, Actually, he would have had many more, many higher chances of getting employed in a university if he had been 60 or 50, no matter what, uh, what his skills were. I'm not saying that this is necessarily the case, but it happens a lot, at least in my country. Maybe your experience is completely different, but that's a problem that we do find. And the people that we have, we do have very skilled people working in the industry, but somehow uh, we don't have a mechanism in the academia to enable that those people to teach, and uh, that's a problem that I that uh, that I have found uh, in the university that I work for. I mean, maybe here you have a completely different experience, but I like to share. I, I like to share a, a, a different perspective. That that is not necessarily that these people are getting more money in the industry and they don't want to teach, but sometimes that there is uh, there is something missing there that enables these people to share what they learn in the industry with the people in the academy. I just want to add something to that. Um, and I'm speaking only on my experience um, directly. <coughs> Another problem that um, professionals have when they do manage to be able to teach in the university environment is because most of those people don't have um, a PhD. Um, there is an aspect of being treated as a second or a third class citizen. Um, now that's irrespective of your effectiveness as a teacher. Um, it does follow on directly to your promotion prospects. Um, and 
to be to be honest, um, after seven years of doing that and getting disillusioned, um, I gave it up and came back to industry. Um, and I mean, I, I can say that I, I thoroughly enjoyed seven years of teaching, um, but everything else around that was just not not worth it. And it's it's difficult to to want to put back into um, the education system when you're up against hurdles like that. To a different point. But on actual tools, uh, I mean, there's some, if you look at the basic tools, they can have Malibu buffer and not run over it. Malibu is an excellent kitchen site, which basically locks them into Linux on x86 or how we see as a dev platform. So if, for example, you have another dev platform, say Spark, uh, and maybe Solaris, not putting any products for a company I may work for, um, <laughs> uh, having an absence of Malibu on that platform means that. There is no way in hell you can exclusively use that as your data platform. Uh, so it means to do just simple things like that becomes quite hard. And then tools on top of that for the example thing to say you want to not overrun a character array. So you think, no, oh, we're using a C++ compiler for standard string. And then you go, oh crap, I want to internationalize the string. So string string is out. What do you do? Cry in the corner as far as I'm aware. <laughs> um, <laughs> So some, some of those even like primitive programming language tools are just, just suck. Um, or the tools are completely missing on the platform. So you're then trusting that, well, running Valorant on x86 obviously means that we're not going to have any security problems on Spark, on Slack, uh, and hoping for the best, because you know, no data structures or types of are different between the two, right? <laughs> so there's, there's basic things like that. So in other words, someone please port Valorant to Spark and Solaris for me. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking about platform support, there is a lot of value in taking your code and making it run as many places as you can possibly. Because if you get it on a PC, your car is going to be a different sign than every other architecture. Yep. You're going to have um, the line issues on Spark versus x86 and all that sort of stuff. For example, one of the guys in OpenBSD ported the operating system to the MA8K architecture, and he was finding a machine independent bug out every three weeks because of his machine dependent work. So if you have the time, run it as many yeah. places as possible. The, the pick up Belgrade and pick up the architecture differences. There's a difference between having it built and running test suite and actually testing that we're not still doing other nasty things. So we do build on Spark, uh, Linux, uh, sorry, Linux Spark, Linux, uh, how can see, Linux x86, Linux x86, uh, Solaris Spark, Solaris x86, Solaris x86, <coughs> and MacOS, uh, we don't have any MacOS PCC machines, uh, but Intel ones, and that gives a fairly decent test coverage, but some of these sort of oddity security things. I recently found a uh, Seriously, an off by one alloc bug in a decimal to uh, screen conversion routines that have been used for about 20 years. Uh, where it just so happened, you possibly have a large decimal number and put it to you could make a lot of shit break. Uh, <laughs> uh, with a suitable enough large number. So it's kind of worrying in the fact that I don't have some, I only have some of the testing tools and stuff like that. I keep an old Power Z box exactly one thousand one. So if I find a problem on Spark, the first thing I do is I fill it with the next see and I'm like, oh, uh, which seems like an interesting way to program the Spark. Could another approach to this be that we don't use C and that we use virtual machines that do some of the memory management for us? So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, but it reduces the amount of code that's as of this focus. So everything's written in C eventually. But it sounds like this, this word you're looking for is Java, except that it's never had security hole. So <laughs> but, so yeah, there's, there's still that primary problem there. Uh, it's a simple Turing machine at work. Uh, <laughs> brain fog is an excellent 
done you getting worked up? Yeah. Well, I guess from uh, some other people's perspective, uh, taking the virtual machine example, um, we, I, I, you're doing better routers. We've got 64 megs of RAM to play with, and that's when you just have 32 or 16 or out of 2 megs for our first products. We got no uh, choice for a lot of the case that to write it straight to see on weird platforms that don't have these tool supports. So, um, you know, the, the static analysis tools are great, but some, so much of the tools is, is what everyone's working on, which is x86 or PowerPC. So, yeah, a lot of it just doesn't exist. Well, I'd just uh, I'd like to ask another question from the panel um, about tools in general and what's available to um, developers. Uh, I have a feeling that a lot of the tools just aren't very usable. Uh, just how much better could uh, we make security in the industry if we could make our tools more usable, more available? For example, we've been talking about um, parfait and tools for static analysis. We've been talking about uh, uh, we'll leave it at that. I'd just like to solicit some questions. Or some feedback. Uh, I guess just usability. For example, this morning we talked about the whole reboot um, on Solaris speeding that up and how it's made it a lot easier for kernel developers to uh, test problems in the kernel space <coughs> or with drivers, for example, made it quicker. Um, here we've been talking about Parfait and how it's made it easier for uh, the average Windows user and they don't know how to secure the system. Um, <laughs> we've got to make it easier. So, so I, I guess like there's a lot of different aspects to security. Um, I mean, uh, you would need different types of tools for the different types of security. Right? Sure. Um, but but say if we just uh, look in the case of perfect, like, uh, it's purely looking at implementation type of bug. And that's why you can take like here's the module, we'll go through the code, we'll find what bugs you have in that way. Um, now when we started that project at Sun. One of the first questions that I was asked is like, why are you going to embark on yet another set of checking project, right? Because there's so many of these tools available out in the market. And so it's why we want to make the trend is that why is that you're going to put a ton of money using those tools? And there were issues of scalability, precision, and so on that came into play. So we tried to address all of those issues, and so we're to the point where people are happy using them to like. Uh, among the like, small communities that were forming within Sun. Um, but we also looked at this issue of portability, right? And, and clearly, uh, you know, like tools available for Solaris um, are lacking compared to Linux in particular and other mm -hmm. platforms. So, you know, we've tried to make our tools formal and we test uh, on Linux and Solaris and Mac um, as a way of ensuring that the tools can run in different platforms. You know, we can make a available in the future. We're working on that uh, for various different platforms, and so then that can be made available to the community. So, uh, I guess that's exactly my question. Um, you made Parfait a, a usable infrastructure on Solaris. Um, this could be more advances on Parfait, for example. Sure. You said you have to compile the entire code base to get analyzed. A, a new change to a program. Um, right, you can do it as well as well as so on. Yeah, but you can make it more usable. It's yeah. like, like Jane, you know, the data, the mm -hmm. to make it usable, and now people who can go and that's just, that's a given. Right, it's a part of the whole thing. That's right. So mm -hmm. I'm just sort of trying to feel how are we progressing in that space? making things easier for our software engineers, something that you could teach in the first years of university about the role. Are you asking how we'll avoid adding overhead to the process? That's no so way. Yeah. 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 And, and whether we feel we're actually progressing down that path. Yeah. Uh, I, I think there has been some progress in that area. I mean, um, Microsoft 
but one of their schools um, could have you know, integrated into their IDs. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what their IDs for, but um, it, it is there by default so people can actually use it. But it's probably like the first example of a uh, commercial ID that has one of these schools embedded into it, into it for the developers in general. Um, in, in the case of Parkhead, I guess like our focus so far has been more on like, the research side of it, because we're part of the research lab, we're doing a product division. Uh, but we're clearly looking at some of the usability aspects. So like, what does it take for engineers to actually use it? What does it take for the tools to be embedded into the build process? Can it be run overnight? Right? Because all, all of these are, are you know, different levels of granularity that we're looking at, but all of that can help for work. Uh, my comment was just about the uh, virtual machine uh, question earlier, which is a great question, but um, I used to work for the Department of Computer Science at the Australian National University, and so I saw a change. They went to, um, well, they started using very high level languages with automatic storage management in their introductory courses, and I then got to help someone who'd gone through a four year Bachelor of Software Engineering trying to uh, understand why his callback based C stuff that he had to use because that was you know, what he had to write to, why he was getting weird errors which turned out, you know, he was automatically, you know, allocating stuff on the stack and he didn't understand about, you know, the fact that that stuff wasn't there when you returned from the routine because in every other platform he'd used so far in his education, it was all magic. So it's like, if, if, but there's a, you know, but that's, if you try to educate people and say, well, here's the guts of the machine and if you ever need to actually work with guts, you're going to have to have this sort of level of rigor and precision and difficulty um, and then maybe focus on getting the algorithmic expression in some nice high level language. So I don't know, it's like the old MIT, uh, you know, first well, undergraduate program that I had scheme and assembly. You know, so algorithms and then the details and you, would never, you were never going to just assume magic happened when you were programming C. So that is asking a lot of commitment from the kids and uh, Matt, hard and shopping <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's two aspects to teaching people about computers and yeah, you've got the science side, you've got the engineering side. Um, that's a lot of what people are talking about is like, well, we're teaching science and we're teaching algorithms. And, um, and then there's also the engineering side, which is kind of what we call hacking, I guess, in other uh, circles. There's a really good book uh, called Security Engineering by uh, Ross Anderson from Cambridge. And I don't know what's actually been taught in uh, colleges now, but I think it would be really useful if there was like a first year, just a general security engineering course that was available you know, across disciplines, uh, computer science, um, IT, even mechanical engineering, because it, it looks at a whole range of uh, issues like, uh, and some interesting stuff like, you know, how to break into loading machines, how to design um, controls for nuclear weapons, and just to get people's minds kind of thinking without any really deep maths without a really good idea except to start thinking. So I wonder if maybe that might help us to get uh, something kind of interesting like that. Uh, there's certainly, there are, there are textbooks out there. Uh, it's definitely a good thing that should measure. So um, I'm just wondering how much of this is actually about the debugging tools and how much is about getting developers to build the security in mind from the beginning, to engineer their, their software with security in mind. I just keep thinking of uh, all of the, the bugs that used to pop up in send mail and, and since we've had postfix was which was written from scratch with security in mind, in, in that particular zone there's now a lot less security problems. So how much of the problem is this about teaching people how to engineer and design code to be secure from scratch? Well, I think that was part of um the idea of maybe trying to get people to think about security as a more a general topic from the beginning and not necessarily, you know, until later they have to sort of tie things together. But yeah, there, there are people working on um, secure languages and secure operating systems that uh, they're trying to make it impossible to make security errors or very close to impossible. And there's some work recently, uh, and I believe they're not here, the, the NICTA people worked on um, the L4 microkernel, doing some security work, and being able to prove that uh, the system is secure. So, 
maybe down the track we're looking at um, having uh, language environments and um, even operating systems or at least virtual machines on our operating systems uh, to address that. But again, yeah, it doesn't really make people think about security. I have to say one of the one of the best things that I ever did was uh, many years ago was a book called um, Writing Solid Code, which is just a um, I think it was actually a Microsoft press book, and it it just kept hammering home all the way through. You know, check return values from system calls and, and this kind of thing. You'll notice a lot of new programmers don't do that, so because they're trying to simplify the code. But if you if you ever make examples and if you ever deal with um, you know junior developers, always make sure always uh, pick them up on this kind of thing because uh, it's a good habit to, to get into. Just that okay, if, what um, I've just done a I've just done a system call. Uh, even if it's one that you don't really care about, but you should check it anyway. And, uh, you, you never know that uh, error that's coming up might be a, a security attack. Uh, I wanted to comment on your, your previous there about the uh, having a uh, general security curriculum or secure computing curriculum in the, in the universities. Um, we're running a program for with open source curriculums called Jedi, and for anybody who is willing to participate and create a curriculum for universities to use. Uh, we're welcome. We welcome you into. You can find us. We're on Kenai and we're on a couple of other places as well. We we started in Philippines and we have done a lot of different curriculums and we use the Philippines, or, uh, Brazil, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, Russia, China, and a couple of other countries as well. So we're very interested in, in expanding the curriculums we have and if people are interested in, in working on a curriculum for, and everything is complete open source using community. Uh, uh, CC uh, license for all of the curriculums we're developing. So, um, if anybody's interested, let me know, and I'll be willing, willing to put you back to in contact with the people who are going to do things. Um, with regards to security frameworks like SE Linux and the ones you have on this next slide, SPSD. Um, how do you make these things usable? I've tried SD Linux before, and as long as you don't do anything that it wasn't pre-configured to do, it's fine. But as soon as you want to do other things, there's just so many concepts and things that you've got to try and figure out before you can actually do it that most people disable it. Um, so if it's, it, it might be really secure, but if people don't use it, it's, it's obviously not useful. So how, about, how do we go about making these things secure? and easy to use. Is that what's mine? <laughs> um, what you did is um, you just uh, invented new simple security system. <laughs> <laughs> now the reality is that this is this is like the core problem in, in our from our side of uh, our point of view is how to actually make uh, security usable. And uh, so that's that is, you know, an ongoing area of, of challenge. And I think we've, we've actually, in SE Linux, made a lot of um, really significant progress in the last few years of this. Um, if anyone used SE Linux on its first release, it was uh, pretty tough um, to actually get things to work. But now uh, we're seeing, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, probably about 70% of people leaving SE Linux on in, in Fedora, which is just the general uh, user operating system. So, from our point of view, we don't want people to really know that it's there, you know, the, the end user. And the other thing is we want to build higher level abstractions so that it's actually useful to people. Um, so Chaos Mode is an example where uh, we're using SE Linux and uh, namespaces and a number of features to provide uh, a really useful function where you have computers set up in a, an email garden or a, an airport or somewhere where you have untrusted users who use it. And there's actually no configuration. Uh, so this is sort of a high level abstraction we're doing similar with virtualization and, and so on. In terms of being able to um, have system ad administrators manage uh, the security policy, that's, that's a difficult area where again we've got high level abstractions where you don't need to know the language, you just uh, you can actually use a, a graphical user interface. So there have been quite a lot of um, advances made in this area, but it's, you know, it's definitely ongoing. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's an inherently unsolvable problem. It's similar to uh, having um, a complex CPU. You don't necessarily want everyone understanding how to write an assembler. 
uh, so that they can do a spreadsheet, you know, use a spreadsheet, and it just takes time to develop, you know, useful and usable applications on top of that. Uh, and you know, I think generally uh, security has really only come into kind of people's mind as, a, as an important thing really in the last few years since uh, so many people have got on the internet. So it's, yeah, it's probably a bit behind in, in, in the general uh, sort of consciousness of the internet. Do you think that the developer indication, um, but more so that we should head away, uh, we should head away from bringing so much into the kernel and doing more of a kiosk idea or a zone idea to limit the developers from directly accessing the kernel and having a system, really? Like, there's never going to be a standard in education whether you do a one year development course or you do a university degree. Um, do you think maybe we should be doing more design and systems to allow less access to kernel and more, and more of an isolated space to the pocket? So, I think there, do you think where it doesn't affect the system? Do you think that should be more of the approach? Well, it's a, it's a combination. You want things that are, you want systems that end users. Uh, you want to make it easy for them to use it correctly and difficult for them to use it incorrectly. But you also want to want them to think about security as well, and not you know, not stop them from doing it. So definitely, any any measure that can actually make things more secure by default. And I think all the major operating systems now are, are doing this. I know uh, Open Solaris, you know, Linux, even. I don't know how much you're actually going to but they claim that it's more secure. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know, somebody, somebody who uses it can probably answer that. But I think we're now moving to a, where there's an expectation now, at least, that uh, systems are more secure by default and, uh, and come out of the box with, with good defaults. And I think we can see that in browsers, web browser security now. Uh, Firefox, for a long time, led and so did um, Opera. And you know, Safari, and I guess, again, I haven't looked at the Internet Explorer, but I'm assuming that they've uh, started trying to catch up on the security there. So we definitely want people thinking about things. We also do want to make it uh, as secure as possible without thinking about it. So, yes and no. Uh, maybe my question is related. I, I will phrase the question and then explain. Um, are we prepared to use uh, a specific purpose machine instead of using a purpose machine? Uh, the idea is, when you have a, a machine that does everything, you know, a computer can do everything if you put the right device attached to it, um, and then you say to people, okay, here you have a machine that can do everything, but I'm going to restrict you to do something, just some, some things. Uh, probably some people naturally will say, okay, why if I have this powerful machine, I'm restricted to that and I try to break it. Um, I think, but but on the on, on, on the on the same way, people want more things on their machines. I mean, I see some uh, icons there or small things browsing the internet and everything. So we are putting a lot of features in in, in machines, and what we do is, or what we want is more features in the machines, and then tell the people on, on, on security, okay, uh, I put all these features on the machines and then the machine is not secure, I fix it. So uh, what we have to do first, uh, restrict people and then grow in an orderly way or try to fix the mess as, 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 we, as, as we go. Um, we've had appliance items that do small tasks for a long time. We have appliance routers, we have appliance switches, we have appliance storage devices, we have appliance phones, we have appliance sand you know, equipment disk arrays, and we've had security problems on switches, we've had security problems on storage appliances, we've had more security problems than anything on routers. Um, I don't think restricting scope really helps at all. I mean, even the simplest of Nokia phones with Bluetooth and Symbian um, are potentially exploitable to a Bluetooth distributed virus. So restricting functionality doesn't help security, it just narrows things, you know, 
and leads to more variety of devices out there which probably leads to less QA on the actual devices. So in a way, more general purpose equipment means there's less distribution of resources for, for quality assurance. So, just one more comment. Uh, there was some talk about you know, hacking, uh, you know, into uh, hacking as uh, a way of motivating people to think about security. But um, isn't it true that I mean, if you read say Bruce Schneier's sort of columns, he's much more interested in working out what he will think about traditional cons. He will think about you know traditional cranks. He will think about anything where you subvert some some kind of business model or assumption that people have. Upon which they face it. I mean, the sort of typical thing with Microsoft, I mean, um, you yeah, know, Trigil, Andrew Trigil made reference to uh, where Microsoft were allowing the clients to tell the server that they'd sanitized the path to um, something in SMB. And of course, if you turn this bit off and pass in an unsanitized path, give out, it just, you know, it will screen the server. And so it's like, it's, it's Yo, yeah, well, let's do a good demo. Let's have something where as soon as you walk up to your house, the door automatically opens for you. And then they spend the next 10 years trying to work out why the door opens to random people. And it's <laughs> the, the fundamental mindset of, of just thinking about cons, thinking about social engineering, all of those things should <coughs> uh, feed a security mindset even more than just fake. I was going to say, I, I agree that maybe uh, you could include like a lock picking course at, at, as the first year of university. You actually get a real lock picking because that's, you know, they're, they're, they're hack conventions now, they, they often have workshops. And it's definitely a, a mindset that if you're training engineers who are going to write the software that sort of would stand the hacks from these people, uh, they need to you know, sort of walk in those shoes for really. Uh, just a, a quick one about the curriculum development for education. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. The ACM Information Assurance Curriculum workshop was held last week in Paris and that curriculum we'll see early next year fully developed. At the same time, uh, that will be approved by the ACM and the Archive League will be a uh, major curriculum. Uh, at the same time, for those who say, if you want to find that, go uh, do a search on ACM, Information Assurance Curriculum. It should come up very quickly. The workshop is there. The second one, we've already got a curriculum that's been there for 15 years, 16 years. Uh, do a search on CNSS 4011, okay, which is the United States Government Information Assurance Teaching Curriculum, 4011 to 4016. Uh, the other six curricula, which are formed for education purposes, okay? Yeah, I want to do that for the adults being available and open source and available for universities in any country? Yes, absolutely. 100% spot on. The ACM1 IEEE will actually be based around the 4011 and 4016. If you go to the web, if you just do a, a search, CNSS 4011, you'll actually see the full curriculum uh, for the adults. So that's the first one. So things are changing, this is good. The um, second one about um, user-friendly security versus, I think we're always manager-friendly security. The end user shouldn't see it. For example, in SE Linux, we really should make that transparent to the end user. What we're talking about is making the setup simple for the CIO, the, the security manager, whoever it be, in enterprise. That's what we really need. And we had that in a system called Trusted Solaris. Trusted Solaris version 8, which was a very, very good system. Unfortunately, it's been discontinued. So, um, we don't have that in the lab. Yeah, but it's not the same. They might have to check rationality. Yeah, for the kernel, it's, it's, it's different. Um, okay, it's, uh, maybe I'll change the Solaris 11 SE. You know, we've seen Solaris. Anyone got a heaven yet? Yes, sir. Okay, fine. But we're present moment, I think Trust of Solaris 8 was a good example of what to do to try and make it manager friendly. Then we can port that across 
third week to the SEO meeting environment, which we're doing. I think we're a good success. Trust as as extensions are actually much, much easier to get installed and setting up because you have prototypes both for kind of classic military information where you have hierarchical structure, but you also have a horizontal structure where you basically can take a template and deploy the template and you have your system set up for you. And then yeah, I found that the, the management of trust extensions are a lot easier than it was in trust as well. But most of the, most of the configuration details are the same. You can basically take the configuration from Trusted Solaris and you can deploy that on Trusted Extensions. But some, some, of, some of the implementation differences are different. In the network sector? Network sector is slightly different. Slightly different, yes. Yeah. Um, as someone who calls themselves an engineer, uh, the drama I've always had is making the business case for doing stuff that doesn't tick off much of so, you can make the business case for hiring another couple of engineers to work on things to make, make, make deadlines and stuff. So, it's all the stuff like sitting down and thinking about the security and stuff where you can't actually make a business case um, on a project budget or schedule for doing business and stuff. And it's not just security, but it's, it, it, it goes things like testing and documentation. There's a lot of things where it's always, yes, if we have any time or money left, we'll do those things. Yeah, I don't know, maybe we need some engineering management training or something like that. Having been in that situation before, quite a bit, um, two words, risk management. Um, a project that's not got a, a formal risk management a strategy and is not addressing the risks um, is the same project that's not doing the things that you can identify as being necessary or successful in project product. No, it's the no legal liability. Yeah. It's not that we had no legal liability. So there's no risk management from the company's point of view. They're not going to be sued. The user statement says, we don't care. You can stop your system. <laughs> if you break it, you can keep both parts. <laughs> but you can also just list what all the risks are and the risk will just get a job done. <laughs> to a point, I mean, once you identify those risks, um, companies can void their public liability by not addressing risks which um, have a high probability of occurrence. Um, and if you're an engineer, um, you're probably a, a member of a professional organisation, and you, you do have a responsibility under your code of ethics, I would hope, um, to try and address those risks and to make them aware to management. As much as, as much as you can. I mean, yes, they may turn around and say no, um, don't spend any effort on this. But at that point, they've made that decision as their risk mitigation measure, a little more the risk. And developers' pride uh, is the best thing. That's free software works, the fact that your name's against it because normally no one's getting uh, exploited because of it. You don't look like that. Um, so, <laughs> if Commander goes, no, you can't fix security holes, you can go, well, I'll go work for myself off the project, uh, fix up the security holes and make a whole lot of money that way, and make yourself look good. So, there's the advantage there of free software model, which goes on to the whole thing of uh, tools, at least in free software development, if they're not free and open source software tools, they are relevant. Uh, on the broad scheme of things, so they're much wider use. Um, So that's a real issue for us. I mean, for development, only having one person able to check the security holes using an automated tool is not exactly a sustainable way to run the project. So we're kind of running uh, near the end of time. So I'm going to ask the panel if they have any final thoughts they want to make before we wrap up for the reception. Well, I have a question. We have found that um, a lot of what well, we would say simple bugs, right? The buffer workloads. And we go back to the developer and they tell you, oh yes, yes, you have a problem with flow. Um, but it's not that important, so we can get it. I mean, why is that?
point is if I say strut, int, and then long and close it, no one here can actually tell me the size of it. The language isn't precise. And that causes problems. Portability problems, security problems. You know, um, as the middle speaker said, you know, we need a new system for security. Maybe that underlies a need for a new system programming language as well. And I said, <laughs> 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 No, I don't mean an existing one. You have to have a low level system programming language. No, you know, but you probably need basically low level secure hardware base, and we've had them in the past in Multics, um, IBM System 38, AS4000, um, Intel 432. But these things were too complex for people to bring the general purpose um, collector of software to. And if they did bring them to them, the costs would be so high that no one wanted to use them. And that's why we have Windows as a virus. <laughs> yeah, as a personal experience with uh, what I, when we were working on the, the TCP and the TCQ uh, project that I presented today, um, we dealt uh, quite a lot with different vendors, developers from open source projects, uh, commercial vendors, and, and so on. Actually, I uh, had quite a few discussions within the IPF. And one thing that uh, I personally learned myself is that, for example, when it comes to um, computer protocols, uh, in many cases, people think that uh, the only thing that there is to uh, secure those protocols is crypto, right? Uh, that's the case, for example, with IPv6. So when you hear about it, when you hear about the supposed uh, improvements that it has in security, or the, the improvements uh, are supposed to be that it, uh, it has a piece of included in it. But there, there's so much more to it that people actually ignore. Uh, when it comes, for example, to the case of uh, IPv6, you realize that for one reason or another, IPv6 is not going to be used, or it's not actually being used, and you end up facing all uh, other type of issues that we face in many protocols, such as how you allocate memory uh, and that kind of stuff. And that's something that I found like, quite <coughs> interesting because uh, for many, well, when we're working on, on this project, the, the attitude of many people was, well, if you want to secure the protocol, just break them and that's it. And there's yeah, well. much more to it, much more to it. And actually in many cases, as I said, uh, there are scenarios in which for one reason or another you cannot use crypto and then you have to go back to those uh, more trivial issues if you want, or not trivial, uh, but things like the ones that I presented today, okay? How you allocate memory, how you impose limits, and all that kind of stuff that people is not paying attention. And the same, the same type of problem that uh, we have found in the last 20 years in IPv4 uh, are probably going to be found in other protocols such as IPv6 because people are not paying attention to those issues because they think that we is going to save their, it's their lives. If it's not going to save your lives, and actually, probably they are not going to use it either. Well, perhaps because of the six uses of IPv6, we'd be quite happy in their own world. <laughs> 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 I've heard there was a conference, both people were very happy. <laughs> 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 I, I, it's a joke, but it's true. I mean, it's an actual IPv6. Who here exclusively runs IPv6? China. 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 You can't afford to be exclusive about that. So many things break. <laughs> so, if I could just thank the panel and then we'll run up to the reception. So, thank you.